According to the 5e Monster Manual, monstrosities defy categorization and in some sense serve as a catch-all category for creatures that don't fit into any other creature type. That's a bad definition. It's like the writer admitted that they couldn't think of a better way to define monstrosities, but we can. My name is Ben Byrne, and this is how to make monstrosities formidable to encounter in your D&D campaign. So why would you choose to use a monstrosity in your campaign instead of literally any other creature type? What purpose does a monstrosity have to your story? Well, fortunately, the monster manual does say that monstrosities are frightening creatures that are not ordinary, not truly natural, and almost never benign. Monstrosities thematically explore the dangers of the natural world, but they are supernatural horrors who bring inherent danger to the regions that they inhabit. Mythological monsters were conceived as ways to explain occurrences in the natural world that were either frightening or mysterious. For example, the story of the Chimera might have originated from a real place in modern Turkey where natural vents in the earth emit burning methane. In Greek myth, Scylla and Charybdis were enormous sea monsters who would swallow sailing ships whole off the shores of Italy. Their story may have risen from natural whirlpools that exist in the region to this day. Today, we understand a lot more about the natural world, but the fun of telling fantasy stories is creating similar mysteries and then giving them supernatural causes. Why are carriages disappearing in the east fold of the forest? Why does it never stop raining on the mountain pass? Why do sailing ships always wreck on those sea cliffs? Your players must first uncover the cause of these events before they can slay it. Monstrosities are the perfect creature to build such mysteries around because there's usually a earthiness to them. Monstrosities aren't entirely incomprehensible or mind-bending like aberrations are. They're not completely alien or from another dimension. They resemble the natural world in a way, but with a monstrous or supernatural twist. A griffin is a hybrid of two real and recognizable animals, a lion and an eagle. A kraken kind of resembles a giant squid, and a phase spider is the most terrifying thing imaginable, an invisible giant spider. Yet unlike beasts, monstrosities are incapable of existing naturally in their region. They are monsters, not animals, and their presence inherently creates disharmony. The example I like to use to highlight this point is comparing dire wolves with winter wolves. Both are essentially fictitious, at least in the modern world, yet in the context of a D&D campaign world, a dire wolf is classified as a beast while a winter wolf is a monstrosity. Dire wolves have a natural impact on their environment, hunting giant elk or wild horses, and probably rarely can conflicting with other predators unless it's over territory. Dire wolves are more likely to avoid the party than attack them, unless the pack is exceptionally hungry or cornered. Their behaviour is animalistic and in some sense predictable. A pack of winter wolves, by comparison, might take down a giant elk just for fun and leave its carcass uneaten. Winter wolves might slaughter a pack of dire wolves instead of deer because they enjoy the challenge of a true fight. Or maybe they're simply just being malicious. Winter wolves are not mere animals driven by instinct. They're figurative and literal monstrosities. It's also fun to surprise players with a winter wolf's ability to speak. The hulking white wolf bares its teeth, and then it snarls in a language you understand. This otherworldly moment, outside the expectations of your players, is exactly what separates monstrosities from beasts. They are preternatural, with magical origins. Diversity among monstrosities is perhaps why they seem difficult to define, but each comes with a unique tale that adds detail and colour to your campaign world. For example, many 5e monstrosities were once common folk who became victims of terrible curses, including harpies, driders, and very famously Medusas. The Roman poet Ovid made an addendum to Medusa's myth that, while sometimes controversial, adds a lot of story depth and moral complexity to 
this monstrosity. Medusa was once beautiful with luxuriant locks of hair. When the sea god Neptune violated Medusa inside the temple of Minerva, Minerva chose to unfairly punish Medusa by turning her into a snake-haired monster. The monster manual version of this story is a little bit sanded down, describing Medusas as self-obsessives who deserve to be cursed, framing them intentionally as villainous. Something closer to Ovid's version offers a way to introduce moral complexity to your campaign. Medusa is undeniably dangerous, yes, but is death her only fate? It's up to your players to decide. And how did Medusa or other monstrosities like her become cursed? A just or unjust punishment from the gods? An arcane accident she brought upon herself? Or was she the victim of a curse cast by a vengeful mage, like what we described in this video about including complex curses in your game? But of course, not all monstrosities have origins in curses. Some might have been birthed by gods or primordial monsters like Echidna and Typhon from Greek mythology. The multi-headed Hydra, fire-breathing Chimera, carnivorous Sphinx, and many others were born from Echidna and Typhon's union. Perhaps powerful monstrosities in your campaign also have divine or maybe fiendish origins? Did carrion crawlers erupt like maggots from the carcass of a dead god? Or maybe yetis are believed to be the offspring of some cruel winter deity like Ariel from Rime of the Frost Maiden? Monstrosities could also be born miraculously during moments touched by magic. A dire wolf who gives birth in the darkness of a new moon instead has a litter of wargs. The body of a murder victim is thrown into a pig pen to hide evidence of the vile deed. The pigs who feed on the remains transform into flesh-hungry ogre swine. To borrow a term from Dale Kingsmill, like this video and email it to your grandma. But to borrow another term from Dale Kingsmill, the incidents that spawn monstrosities can be vague vague and evocative, a small twist of nature that has horrific consequences. Or monstrosities may have very specific causes for their existence. Or the mutated rattlings of Drakenheim who have been affected by eldritch delirium crystals. In searching for new monstrosities to add to your 5e campaign, you should check out Monsters of Drakenheim, which is currently funding on Kickstarter. This 300 page tome offers 150 plus new monsters to terrify your players with, like the Cacophonous Chimera and the John Carpenter looking Bojack. More than just new stat blocks. More than just new stat blocks. More than just new stat blocks. This book also includes ready to run lairs for your adventures and deadly elemental conditions that will make monsters even more formidable to fight. Best of all, Monsters of Drakenheim is the first Kickstarter to be partnered with D&D Beyond, meaning that you can have easy digital access to everything it has to offer upon fulfillment. Roll20 and Foundry support is also available if you prefer. Also, just check out the cinema trailer. Link, link, expand your dark fantasy world with Monsters of Drakenheim. Of course, the deep lore of every monstrosity doesn't necessarily need to be known or understood by your players. Not every encounter requires detailed exposition. But a monstrosity story can help inspire you to build an intriguing adventure around it, or find places to put them in your world to use as side encounters. In past videos, I've told you to stop using undead or aberrations in your campaign without an intentional thematic purpose for doing so. Mind flayers are terrible to use for random encounters, because if they're as common in your campaign world as a pack of wolves, they're gonna become far less threatening and far less mysterious. Monstrosities can kind of fill that gap as common encounters because of their earthiness, their kind of thematic tie to twisted nature. They don't need quite as much mystique or build up around them to make them seem formidable. Monstrosities might show up in a region as a symptom of a larger threat. And this is where it's important to understand where where they've come from. Maybe carrion crawlers are attracted to a region by the large remains left by a feeding dragon. Or is a necromancer summoning phase spiders to help protect its lair in a deep dark forest? Monstrosities can act as a sort of appetizer to an even greater monster. Or they can be encounters for your party to cut their teeth on in their early adventuring careers. At level four, the party defeated a chimera, but at level eight, they managed to topple a dragon. But that's not to say that monster monstrosities can't be the focus of an adventure all on their own. So let's take a closer look at some monstrosity stat blocks. 
The Medusa obviously is an absolute classic. Throw her into your campaign, build her up with stone statues in a yard. Perhaps the players see her silhouette first with her snake hair. But you can also red herring a Medusa by using basilisks or lupalisks instead. I also really love the Bahia. Its lightning breath is super evocative and it just feels a little bit different from a dragon in a way that feels more earthy and more like twisted nature rather than the big epicness that a dragon fight turns into. The Hydra and its variants is formidable because it has as many attacks each turn as it has heads. This is likely going to be five attacks at the start of a fight, but that can grow exponentially. Its reactive heads ability also means it gets as many opportunity attacks a turn as it has heads, making it difficult to retreat from a Hydra without disengaging. Honestly, for extra challenge, I'd even homebrew a rule that says if the Hydra spends two of its reactive head reactions, it can opportunity attack a creature that has disengaged. This makes it feel especially difficult to escape the Hydra's multitude of snapping heads. That said, describing how its heads fall off and regrow does take a little bit of finesse. Because most players know the myth of the Hydra and are therefore quick to describe how they are explicitly not slicing off any of the monster heads and aiming for its body instead. You should describe that the Hydra heads falling off isn't because they're being decapitated, but it's a defense mechanism, kind of like how a lizard drops its tail. A Hydra head dies when it takes a certain amount of damage deliberately so that it can grow to others and regain some health. A snapping Hydra is like a turtle version of it that offers a higher AC. A Draco Hydra has breath weapons and is distinctly more dragon themed. Or take a giant Gastra from Grim Hollow's Monster Grimoire as a goose Hydra for fey themed quests. I personally prefer a griffin to an owl bear for a tier one monstrosity encounter. A pair of griffins offers a very dangerous fight with a unique challenge due to their fly speed. Owl bears have a very D&D flavor to them, which is great for heroic settings like Forgotten Realms, but might stick out a little bit in a dark fantasy world like Grim Hollow. Uh, maybe I just have uh, nostalgia for the white orchid quests at the start of The Witcher. Winter Wolves, I've already said, are great for their intelligence and their icy breath. They make for menacing social encounters right before a fight, which adds an extra dimension to encountering them. The Dark Feather is also one of my favorites from Grim Hollow's Monster Grimoire, simply because its lore gives you an instant mystery to create a monster hunting quest around. A town or city is suffering from a plague. Yet, some of the cadavers exhibit unique signs that suggest they were not killed by the disease. Can your party follow the clues that lead them into an encounter with the Dark Feather Enclave, who lair within the city sewers or possibly in the high belfry at the center of town? A Vitabrie is also a Grim Hollow monstrosity that you can build a great mystery and intrigue around as it dominates and manipulates people around it. A Vitabrie hides as a human child. It's not a potent physical threat, but its challenge is discovering its identity as it hides in a village in plain sight. Those it dominates may be the physically dangerous ones. For something a bit more primal feeling, consider an Ithyar. This crocodilian sky serpent feels maybe a bit more unique and again earthy than a wyvern, but it hits honestly almost as hard. The stormborn Ithyar is further evocative with a lightning and thunder breath weapon that averages six damage on a failed save and is possibly an alternative to a skyborn Bahia. Have an epic showdown atop a mountain that is always raining because of the Ithyar's presence. All right, I'm getting a little bit carried away here, but I love, love, love witch owls from Grim Hollow as well. They can replace a hag at the center of a deep forest, twisted pagan adventure inspired by horror movies like The Witch or The Ritual. It'd definitely be a tier one adventure with how strong the Witch Owl stat block is, but the stat blocks provided in the Monster Grimoire include the Witch Owl sneaky cultists and even a more powerful Witch Owl hexter to probably base your uh, quest around. At higher levels, Witch Owls could be minions to more powerful fey such as hags, in which case you should watch this video we made about terrifying hags and witches for your 5e game. Or if you want to understand more about creating epic monster lairs, watch this video instead. Like this video if you enjoyed it or found it useful and subscribing to the channel allows you to join our Dark Fantasy campaign for more grim and gritty 5e content.